Bayview Spotlight. I'm Rachel Barenbaum, and today my guest is Desmond Hall. His new book just dropped, Your Corner Dark. It is unbelievable. And I had the super lucky privilege of reading this book drafts and drafts ago. I absolutely have loved it all along from day one. Des, I'm so, so excited for you. Tell me, what is your book about? So, um, the, well, first, the title, Your Corner Dark, is a Jamaican phrase, which means being stuck between a, a hard place. And my protagonist, Frankie, is a Jamaican teenager who lands this full ride scholarship to study at the University of Arizona in America. And it's the golden ticket until his dad gets hit with a stray bullet and Frankie has to get money for quick medical expenses. And the only way he can do it is by joining his uncle's posse, which is a gang, Jamaican word for gang, posse. So I love that already we're talking about Jamaican word, right? You're translating the Patois for us. Mm -hmm. Language is a really big part of the book. And I would love to hear how you thought about that, what you decided to translate, you know, and why, and how did that go with your editor? Yeah, so I mean, the, the process was iterative. Um, you know, even with working with the writing groups at, you know, Grub Street and others, finding the right balance of Patois you know, Patois in Jamaica, you know. Um, and, you know, it's a little bit getting people to understand the writing, because I started at first really heavy, like how I, you know, like how, you know, people speak and how country people speak sometimes in Jamaica can have a very heavy Patois. So I had to make a tough choice because sometimes people didn't get what was going on. And I'd have to rewrite and do different drafts with different levels of Patua to allow people to actually understand what was going on. Because people back home will, you know, they'll get it. But, you know, for all the readers who are not Jamaican or Caribbean, they needed a little bit, a little bit um, less Jamaicanized version to understand it. So on page three, I think you really set up the entire book. Um, wow. And you write, Frankie's, there's the scene where Frankie's uncle asks his nephew about a scholarship. Um, and he says, he says, to, the uncle says to Frankie, if you get it, you're going to run away from jam down. You're going to leave your people. Joe was still smiling, but his words felt like a slap. And that for me was like the crux of the book from page one, <laughs> right? What are you going to do? Are you abandoning your people? Or are you taking that, you know, are you taking that scholarship, that push pull? And, and I just loved how you set that up. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, well, brain drain is real, you know, and um, so many young people in Jamaica, even when well qualified, can't find jobs and can't find work. So of course, Frankie looks at this as like a great opportunity, but the kid does legitimately, like most Jamaican expats, they want to come back home, you know, they love yard and they want to come back and like do something. But the economic situation is tough. And Joe, you know, he, he's, uh, he has a different point of view. He doesn't want anyone, he doesn't want his nephew leaving. And he's also, you know, as you astutely see, he, um, he, there are some underlying reasons that Joe uh, has for wanting Frankie to stay in Jamaica which we won't give away now because it would be a big spoiler. Right, we're trying to keep that away. And also I should apologize for my horrible white American pronunciations <laughs> of, your, <laughs> of your words in there. No, man, no, 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 it's all good, all good. But just beautiful. So um, also still in those first few pages, um, we see a Glock, we see a street fight, and we see a father beating his son. So right from that very beginning, we know that there's violence, right? Yes. Can you talk about including that right from the beginning? Was that a discussion with your editor at all or your agent? Yeah, so that, uh, that um, you know, I got to uh, with the Grub Street crew, you know, and setting up everything in that first act. And I think um, that's a sort of a, a Robert McKee, because I'm a true disciple of Robert McKee's story. And um, he believes in always setting up your characters to 
face greater and greater adversity to reveal true character because you know we all know talk is cheap and the idea is that you only reveal yourself by you know uh showing yourself through your actions under a great deal of pressure and my agent the beloved Faye Bender and the amazing Caitlin DeLuy my editor they fully understood that and only helped me to sharpen those uh those uh, plot points early on. I just loved it. Um, and another thing that I really love about this book is, you know, you don't shy away from the violence. No. And there are many, um, many YA books that do, I should say this is a YA novel, mm -hmm. and there are many that shy away from it. And I've spoken to parents um, and made enemies of parents, <laughs> right, who don't think that their kids should be reading this kind of violence. Um, can you talk about why you think it's important to include it and to have teens reading about it? Well, I think, you know, the, I think some great writers said uh, the act, the very act of writing is a political act. And I think the violence being shown all serves the story. You know, it's only when violence is gratuitous that there should be a problem with it, at least in my point of view. And I think, you know, by showing the violence between father and son, you know, in this particular instance, between the uncle and what Frankie has to do to live in his neighborhood, even though this is, you know, a valedictorian level kid who can, you know, gets all A's in uh, AP calculus, engineering and everything, he still has to, you know, take care of himself physically. And in, you know, that case you mentioned, he has to stick up for his friend. And that's reality in, you know, the part of Jamaica that a lot of people don't get to see. You know, they get to see the fancy come back to Jamaica commercials, you know, film shot for a million bucks and it looks great and everything is just fine and wonderful. But there's another side where it's not, where people, um, you know, people often call themselves sufferers. And, you know, because of the economic system, and you know the way the economy has gone on a debt spiral for so long it's it's put them in a bind and so i think you know that violence uh, just depicts the reality so do you think some people are going to be afraid to talk about your book i i don't know you know that's above my pay grade you know i just uh, i just put put what i think is the truth down there on the page uh, and then you know let the chips fall where they may so there were so many parts of this book that I loved. I feel like I keep prefacing each question with another thing that I loved. <laughs> but, no, I love that. <laughs> okay, so something that really drew me to this book was the fact that this is really a coming of age story mm -hmm. for boys, for Frankie in particular, mm -hmm. and about friendship and his relation to family. And I've read and seen so many about um, YA coming of age for girls. It was such a relief to see this for boys. I look for these kinds of books for my boys. <laughs> oh, were great. you conscious of that at all when you were writing this book? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I've heard it many times that, you know, young adult is, you know, female based. But I think, um, you know, I love the idea that, or I should say the fact that, you know, Frankie, um, has to deal with a lot of how to define himself as a young man, you know, a lot of questions with masculinity are answered, you know, his father, you know, speaks out against him, telling him that he shouldn't cry at his mother's funeral, you know, and Frankie has to deal with that. His uncle pressures him to be tough in a hyper masculine, almost overly macho way, which, you know, this is not who that kid is. So I think it, it helps a lot of young boys understand that they have to define themselves for themselves and they don't have to listen to the old school you know i have to be macho uh viewpoint and i also think in your corner dark i you know i put a lot of strong jamaican women because that you know all the jamaican women in my life have been incredibly strong and i should also ask for some listeners you know um, who might not know you as well as me. Can you talk about your connection to Jamaica? Can you tell us oh. that? Yeah, well, I was born there, you know, and um, I was pretty much a, uh, a, a sort of a barrel child, you know, which is a economic term used for uh, kids who are 
left uh, by their Caribbean parents uh, because they leave to go to the first world uh, to make more money in one year or two years than they can in 10 years back on the island. And, you know, I stayed with various family and friends of family um, and I went back and forth. I spent some time in America and some time back in Jamaica all before I was 11. And, you know, it was a, it was a dizzying experience. So sticking to the subject of, uh, you know, this being a violent book, this being a book that is YA for boys, right? Becoming young men. What do you want your readers to take away from this book? Well, I hope they have a more nuanced version of Jamaica and understand that Jamaicans are not one monolithic group. And um, I think by seeing that, you know, I think they should, and I hope that they understand that, you know, the economy was once booming. You know, when I was a kid, it was two American dollars for one Jamaican dollar. You know, like, think about that, you know, the economy was leading in exports and many, you know, industries and such, but a lot of things conspired to bring the economy down. And as it did, you know, it made it very tough on the people. And I hope that all of that is understood by reading Your Corner Dark. I know that you do a lot of work with, um, let's say, at-risk youth, and you work with youth centers, um, and that you, uh, part of your launch, and a super impressive part has been you raising money um, to buy copies, to give and donate to high schools around Boston, the Boston public school system. Uh, Seems, uh, it's amazing. I wish more authors would do that. Can you talk about your work there and how you're hoping to reach those kids possibly with this book? Yeah, I've uh, started to work with 826 Boston, and um, they work with a lot of kids around the Boston area um, and help them with their writing and uh, other ways to, for them to sort of forward themselves. And I find that to be an absolute honor. First, the organization is, is wonderful, and I believe it was founded by Dave Eggers, the, the noted writer. And um, I, I really, really love working with them. And I feel that I have to give back because when, um, when I think about where I've come from, you know, the, the mountaintops in Jamaica and um, the journey that I've had, I am incredibly lucky to have um, arrived where I, where I am and to continue on. So I need to pay it forward. Another organization that is near and dear to both of our hearts is Grub Street. Oh, yeah. Woo! Shout out to Good Michelle job. Hoover. I know we're both grubbies. So uh, what do you have to say about Grub Street? Oh, I mean, I, I can't say enough about Grub Street. Grub Street has made me a writer. It, without Grub Street, I would not have been. And Grub Street also has this incredible community you know, and I wasn't always a believer in that type of writing community, but man, did it open my eyes. Um, you know, it gives you so much support and in the process, as well as, you know, you get great ideas and thoughts and it's, it's just amazing. I, I would say anybody who wants to write on any level should get themselves to Grub Street. How hard was it to find an agent and get this book published? Wow. So... Grub Street has this Muse and the Marketplace, uh, the num America's number one writing conference. And they sort of usher, they, Grub Street, usher us into this uh, writing conference after we come out of the novel incubator program. And we get to meet the top editors and agents in the world, you know, and this just an amazing process. So while there, you know, myself and many of my classmates got a chance to pitch, you know, our books and several agents asked for, you know, the full manuscript. And from that, you know, I got, you know, a few offers. And then there was a grubby, um, you know, Jennifer de Leon, who's written the great book, Don't Ask Me Where I'm From. And she, um, you know, then in introduced me to her agent, Faye Bender. And she was in the hospital at the time. She said, no, 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 don't sign anything yet. Don't, uh, let me introduce you to Faye. And Faye, you know, sent me like two pages, single spaced uh, notes. And I was like, wow, you know, the book is better already with these notes. So, you know, I signed with Faye who then sent it out. 
And then, you know, um, several uh, publishers got back uh, right away, pretty much, you know, in two weeks. And I had a, co a conference call with Caitlin DeLuy at Caitlin DeLuy Books, part of Simon & Schuster. And, you know, she made a preemptive offer, a two book deal. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> am I the luckiest man in the world? And so, you know, signed with her and it's been a wonderful experience. Amazing. So Jen was also on the show for anyone who's interested. You can listen on uh, past episodes from the archive. Amazing, amazing book. Don't ask me where I'm from. Um, so I could talk to you all day, but I have to wrap it up. <laughs> so I need to ask, what kind of advice do you have for new or aspiring writers? Oh, that's easy. Uh, one, there's there's some great quote again um, that said where a writer said, the published writers are the ones that didn't give up. And then the second thing is go to Grub Street. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Des, thank you so much. Your Corner Dark is absolutely fantastic. Many, so many, many.